So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it happens to be where you are. My name's Stuart Corney. I'm from the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania in Australia. I'll be chairing today's session. Um, so welcome, this is uh, the mini symposium on the highlights of SCAR's three scientific research programs. I'd like to welcome today's speakers. So we've got Daniela Liggett, Florence Colioni, Tom Bracegirdle, and Deneb Carrant will be up first as our SCAR Vice President. Please note this session is being recorded and will be made available to all participants at SCAR in the uh, past events section of the events platform and hopefully on the SCAR YouTube channel in the near future. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the land upon which I am standing, the Palawa people of, of Australia, of Tasmania. I recognise the history of truth, which acknowledges the impacts of invasion, colonisation upon Aboriginal people, resulting in the forcible removal of their lands. So a bit about why we're here. SCAR uses its, uh, its scientific research programs um, in an effort to highlight, to focus its efforts on high priority topical areas. The three programs we're hearing from today were approved by the executive in 2020 and officially began in January last year, January 2021. Each of the scientific research programs have drawn on the outcomes of the SCAR Horizon Scan to identify fundamental science questions of relevance to the Antarctic and use those to motivate their research programs. Today, one of the co-chairs from each program will be giving us a 15 minute update on current activities and status of the research program. Following that, we'll have be hosting a panel discussion where we'll explore linkages between the SRPs. I've got a few questions ready, but also, of course, invite questions from the audience, which can be posted in the Q&A function of Zoom, or you, you can post comments in the chat function. So we prefer to use the Q&A so we can keep a track of the questions, but if it's just a comment, put it in the, the chat function. So then before we hear from each of the programs, I'd like to introduce Deneb Carrants from the University of San Francisco and SCAR Vice President for Science. Deneb will be giving us a brief overview of the SCAR scientific research programs. Over to you, Deneb. And you're on mute, of course. Sorry, you think Always. after all this time I would know that. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Um, and welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to have you join us for this session on the highlights of SCAR's scientific research programs. As, um, as Stuart mentioned, I am the SCAR Vice President for, sorry, I'm the SCAR Vice President for Science. And before we get to the main presentations today, I just want to take a few minutes and, and provide an overview of the SCAR scientific research programs, um, put them in the context of the organization, and also um, give you a little bit of background on how these programs come about. I know that um, many of you in the audience might be very familiar with SCAR, but I also know that we have people in the audience who are new to SCAR. And so I think it's important um, to just go over some of the basics. And I'm gonna start with um, this uh, very colorful diagram, which has a huge amount of information on it. I really don't have time to go into detail about the whole thing. And I'm not expecting that you can read everything that's on here, but I think it's important to put the, the organizational structure of SCAR um, into context and to, to show that um, it's a complex organization and we have a lot of different um, subsidiary groups that all come together um, to make SCAR a success. So up here in the middle at the top, um, we have the, the delegates, there's a president, there's four vice presidents that um, with the president make up the executive committee. Um, I would like to mention the secretariat. They are the people that keep SCAR going on a day-to-day -day basis, which is quite important for us. Um, we have the science groups, geosciences, life sciences, physical sciences, and then you see a lot of these green and red boxes, which represent um, expert groups, action groups. These are committees that have very specific focus and um, address a lot of the details that, that go on in terms of SCAR activities. 
We also have standing committees, these um, lighter blue boxes um, around the edges. And then here are the scientific research programs um, here in this orange color. I would encourage you to go to the SCAR website and take a look at these um, various, or look at this structure. There is a, another page attached to this, which spells out all of the acronyms. And I think you'll find that there's something on here for everyone. And so please take a look. If there's something of interest to you, interest for you, um, you can get in touch with those groups and, um, and get involved. Today, we're gonna focus on these three scientific research programs. So um, what is an SRP? Um, this is a, a quote that's taken from the SRP guidance document. Um, essentially, the scientific research programs are the flagship initiatives for SCAR. Um, they look to address new questions about the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean. Um, a very important aspect of these, in addition to the science that they address, is that they are a way of fostering international collaboration and cooperation. And that's essentially a, a hallmark of SCAR's success and one of the major aspects of SCAR's mission. The way that SRPs come about is through program planning groups. And these are grassroots efforts. So essentially, there'll be a group of scientists that come together and they'll decide that there's some new area that needs to be investigated. And so program planning groups are formed. Um, the proposals that come out of these are based on quite a lot of community input. And it's not a quick process. Many times these um, program planning groups are around for multiple years, developing and honing these proposals which will eventually go to the science groups. From the science groups, the proposals are passed on to the delegates. So the delegates have the final approval for whether or not something becomes a scientific research program. And I would like to make just a, a brief note that SCAR does not fund research. The research that's done with these um, SRPs is actually research that's funded by mostly national Antarctic programs. But the SRPs do have a budget, and that can be used for administration, travel, and, and other costs. The, this whole scheme of scientific research programs um, started in 2004. At that time, SCAR underwent a major restructuring. So that organogram I showed you was completely different before that. Um, and this slide here is just listing um, the first of the scientific research programs that were developed. The average lifespan of an SRP is about six to eight years. After these were retired, there was another set of SRPs that came into, an, into existence, and those are listed here. As you can see from the titles, there's a lot of different topics that are covered. And within each of these topics, there's a lot of different disciplines that can become involved. The last five of these SRPs were retired in 2020. And as Stuart mentioned, um, there were three new SRPs that were put into place um, starting last year. And that's what we're gonna hear about today. So the current scientific research programs, and you're gonna hear a lot of details about these, um, ANCLIM Now, which is looking at the Antarctic climate system on time scales of years to decades. INSTANT, which is looking at Antarctica's past, present, and future contributions to sea level and Anticon, which focuses on conservation and management. For today's session, um, you'll be hearing a lot more detail on each of these from people that are involved with the leadership of these groups. And then the last hour, the last half of this session will be a panel made up of the, the presenters and they will discuss the interconnections between the various SRPs and answer any questions that you have. And if you could put those questions into the Q&A channel, um, that would be great. And we'll get to those when, when the panel begins. So I'd like to thank you um, very much for attending and I hope you enjoy this session. And I also hope you enjoy the rest of the Open Science Conference. And I'm trying to stop Thanks, sharing. To I'm trying to find my cursor to stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start talking anyway. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, so, so thanks for that, Deneb. And uh, you've already introduced the, the three programs. So we'll start and ANCLIM Now is first. So ANCLIM Now so it aims to answer the fundamental science questions 
related to Antarctic climate variability. The program takes a regional approach to observing and modeling the Antarctic environment, but takes an integrated approach to consider the Antarctic as a whole. The program is led by Tom Bracegirdle, the British Antarctic Survey, and Ileana Weiner from the University of Sao Paulo. Today, Tom is giving us an overview, although Tom gave that overview earlier this week and, uh, and it's quite late for Tom, so I think it's just gonna be a pre-record. So if you notice he has a different shirt on, that's why. Um, how are we doing this, Tom? I think yeah, the yeah. IT team should be able to start playing it now. So yeah, play the pre-record. Thank you very much and good morning. So can you see my full screen slide? Yes. Excellent. Well, thanks for the uh, invitation to speak today. It's a real pleasure to be speaking so early in this exciting conference. I should acknowledge that uh, uh, the, the co-chair of Anklin now, Ilana Weiner, um, uh, is, is away at the moment, so she couldn't be here, but uh, and she, she and the rest of the team are a major part of everything I'll, I'll show. So I'll be giving a flavour of the research programme that um, Anklin now. And so if you get if you're more interested in some of the things that I talk about, you can always find more at the website um, or hear more on Twitter or Instagram and various other channels that, that you can follow us on. So, Anklin now is, as, as was said earlier, is focused on climate change and variability on scale of years to decades. And to help put this into context, this plot here, although it shows global temperature, gives a sense of the types of things that we'll be looking at. So, <laughs> um, I'm just going to see if I can bring up a little laser pointer here. There we go. So this shows global mean temperature uh, with observations in the black, and then different climate model simulations in these different colors uh, looking ahead in, into the future. And what you see from this is that the climate change doesn't just happen in a steady, um, a steady curve. There are lots of wiggles and variations along the way. And so you have periods of, of stable temperature and then and, and rapid changes. And you can see this in the global mean, like this picture here, but actually that's more, uh, more striking over regional areas like Antarctica. So it's important to understand you know, not, not just the, the steady background change, but also these, this, these more rapid variations um, in terms of making sense of what's, what's happening now, um, what's been happening in recent decades, and, and what may happen in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So when we look at the prediction problem, it can go from days uh, to centuries. So. Um, on daily time scales, you know, thinking about weather forecasts, that type of thing. Um, and Anklin now's main focus is on this uh, annual to decadal time scale. And there's a range of different processes that contribute to changes on these time scales that are highly important. So things like uh, ENSO, um, QBO, and then looking on, on longer time scales. You've got decadal variability, so specific decadal variability and other aspects that have impacts from, from lower latitudes. The Anklin Now program is structured in a way that is designed to help answer some of the main questions we have in this area and also to develop strong linkages with other programs, which is what we'll be talking about today. So we're looking at uh, climate variability and the global climate system. So I mentioned Pacific variability there, but there's many other ways in which 
the variability in Antarctic climate are linked more globally. Understanding what's happening now, uh, and that um, ranges from some of the rac rapid decadal changes that we're seeing, but also there is an interest in some of the climatic, the possible climate leakages to extreme events that are occurring at the moment as well. Uh, so that is a, a key focal point. The predictability of the Antarctic climate system. How well can we confidently estimate changes in, in the near term? And then looking at global and regional cross-disciplinary impacts um, and communications to the, the wider community and other stakeholders in the Antarctic community and globally. So I'm going to go through some slides. Um, I won't say too much more about exactly what's it, it, in the, uh, under these themes. So you know, if you want more information, you can go to our, our website and the uh, science and impl implementation plan is there. What I'm going to do is show some highlights of the activities that we've currently got going in these different themes, just to give you a flavour of, of of how things are getting going with Anklin now, we're sort of a year and a half old. And that will that will be a big that that'll help give give you an idea of some of the things we're doing um, and some of the things you might want to get involved with and some of the ways that Anklin now is linked across different other other SRPs and other parts of SCAR as well. So in theme one Antarctic climate variability in the, the global climate system. One of the things that we're focusing on initially is the observations of the Antarctic climate system. Um, if we're going to better understand variability, then uh, we need to continue to improve observations. One of the ways of promoting this that, that we're running at the moment is a, a data set development and stewardship scheme. This is an annual scheme that uh, we run every March. And to put out a call for a small amount of money to help work with people to improve or develop aspects of data sets around Antarctica. And immediately this illustrates the this sort of cross linkages aspect of some of this work. So um, we've got uh, work with a SUS endorsed initiative and contributing to helping develop a website and um, reaching out to bring in more data for that. So Sarah Thompson at the University of Tasmania is working on that one. And then we have Megan Thompson Munson from the University of Colorado looking at surface mass balance and, and snow depth on sea ice, which is a very variable, uh, something that has large decadal and annual variability is important to understand in the context of Anklin now. And also uh, Matthew Lozara at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, looking at more traditional, I say traditional, looking at uh, Antarctic meteorological research data and improving um, the, the linkages there. And, and so the, this is one activity, one example of, of something we're doing to help improve um, observational information around Antarctica. Another thing we have a lot of going on is, is uh, workshops and other and conference sessions happening this, this year. Um, so in understanding present day climate trends in Antarctica, it's becoming increasingly apparent that uh, trends and extremes are quite tightly linked. So for example, precipitation over the Antarctic continent is strongly linked to short bursts of high precipitation 
that can be brought about by things like atmospheric rivers, which are a topic of great interest at the moment. And we have a, a special session at an upcoming conference, the Atmospheric Rivers Conference, um, that we've helped to fund looking at that. We're also developing a project to, to monitor the Antarctic climate system in almost real time using a range of major Antarctic climate indicators. We've got a workshop in Cambridge coming up in October to look at theme three, which is predictability of the Antarctic climate system. And again, uh, looking at ob observations, but this time more in the context of bringing together observations and, and models and trying to um, make the best use of connecting the two. And uh, registration is still open for this workshop with a deadline um, of early September, I think the 4th of September. So if, you, if you're interested, um, have a look at our website, there's a link there, um, and or do get in touch. But we are also looking at um, modelling as well and beginning to, to look at the role of year to year variability and uh, aspects. Of uh, climate, climate across different parts of Antarctica. Um, I won't go into the detail of this plot just now, but all I can say is that that um, is a map, a plot looking at temperature change into the future um, with the steady background climate change and then year to year variability on top, just to illustrate the, the major role of um, year to year variability in the seasonal projections and looking at how best to bring that information into a projection, into looking at projections and predictions. In theme four, in terms of cross-disciplinary impacts, there was a really successful workshop that we had run, ran in, in May and June. Thanks very much to Jan Lennertz for running this. The International Fern Workshop, and it had 100, approximately 150 participants from across the world. Um, and, and actually this workshop illustrated that in addition to the scientific aims of Anklin now, the capacity building aspect is very important as well. And we brought in coaching for presentations for, for 18 early career researchers. And I think that from, from what I hear, that was very, very well received. And then link, um, you know, thinking across disciplines, a big part of that is working with other scientific research programs, which you'll hear about later in this session. So there's a, a conference next year uh, that will be a great, uh, with instant, which will be a big chance to, to link up across different SRPs. And then theme five, uh, communication of results to stakeholders. The other scientific research program that we hear from, and ICON, are a big part of this. And one of our committee members um, also works with Anticon, and, uh, well, in fact, a number do. And, and partly through that, uh, we've had climate related presentations at meetings such as the International Whaling Com Commission uh, workshop in, in December of last year. Then th through SCAR as well, COP26 side events. Something that we're working on internally is an annual update on science relevant to Anklin now. The exact form of this update is still under, under discussion, but we're certainly interested in developing it in a way that could be accessible to the wider audience. So we'll, we'll, we'll be working on that going forward and interested in discussing um, how ways in which that could develop. 
so the the the, the team in Anklin now, uh, so core chief officers, myself and Lana Weiner, and then we have a scientific steering committee who have all contributed hugely to to, to what we've been doing, to the, the activities we've had in the last year and a half. And they're all linked into different themes, but in many ways, we've all also just been working together a lot. But of course, the steering committee and the, the leadership are really part of a, a growing community. In the first part of Anklin now, one of our major focuses has really been to just develop a, a larger community and, and bring more people into the programme. We hold monthly science talks to try and um, encourage dissemination of, of science and, and keep momentum going on discussions. And we have early career researcher support for attendance at conferences and workshops. If you're interested in joining, just go to the uh, website on the, on the SCAR website. I think there was a link just posted to that in the chat, so um, and you can go there. And there's a mem membership application form that you can fill in. And as I mentioned, we have many other uh, um, ways of following our activities, um, including a, a YouTube channel with those monthly talks. Thanks very much for listening, and I look forward to discussing more later today. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tom. I, I don't need to say thank you, because Tom has done it already. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, and I noticed that you posted the uh, the links to the Ant Kim Now site and the other SCAR site on, well, another answer, Clean now, is that the conference coming up or? It was for the science and implementation plan as well. Science implementation plan, sorry. Uh, if you have questions of Tom or any of the panelists, it's best that we put them in the, uh, the Q&A function that should be at the bottom of your screen and we'll deal with them in the panel session coming up after the three talks. So we'll move on now to to instant instabilities and thresholds in Antarctica, really working the acronyms. This scientific research program addresses first order questions about Antarctica's contribution to sea level, encompasses geoscience, physical sciences, biological sciences, investigates the way in which interactions between ocean, atmosphere and cryosphere have influenced ice sheets in the past and what expectations will be in the future, looking specifically at global sea level change. So the program is led by Tim Nash from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand and Florence Collioni from National Institute of Oceanography and Applied Geophysics in Trieste, Italy. Today, we're going to hear from Florence to give us the update. Florence, over to you. Unmute yourself. You're still on mute. Thank you, Stuart, for go. the introduction. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so, um, well, it has been a, a long run. I mean, uh, we have been presenting the, the SLPs a few times during the, the business week and uh, and now the last time during the, the, the Open Science Conference. Uh, you can, in general, follow Instant in the different social medias. Uh, you can follow out activities. We have uh, also two websites. The, the official website on the SCAR website and our instant external website that's a bit more customized uh, where you might see a bit more of the activities of each of the subgroup of instant that I will be explaining in a, in a minute. Um, so what is this instant and, and what do we do? So actually instant stands as for instability and thresholds in Antarctica and with a, a sub title that we wanted to be the Antarctic contribution to sea level change. 
So this SRP is, is, is very big. So Tim and I are uh, co-leading it, but together with a huge list, list of uh, co-leaders and uh, subcommittee leaders that uh, I would be showing uh, in a while. Um, instant, because it's a very multidisciplinary program, is related to the geoscience group, the physical science group, and the life science group. And, um, and so um, this is uh, a very a very large program, um, and definitely a lot of things is are going on since the the kickoff, uh, and and you can you can follow it. What is the basic the basis of instant is related to the deep uncertainty that we have in projecting um, sea level change, uh, and uh, at the heart of this uncertainty is Antarctica. Antarctica is the main, for the moment, statist statistically speaking, is the main contributor to this uncertainty, and this is because Antarctic reacts uh, with some insta instable behaviors. Actually, also Greenland's do in the marine-based part of the of the ice sheet, but um, the instability and, and threshold is more related to the Antarctic ice sheets. And actually, because of this uh, instability threshold uh, behavior, um, the Antarctic, the I mean, the, the global mean sea level rise could be very, uh, very, very high. I mean, much higher than what has been proposed by IPCC. And actually. Um, and this time in the last report, uh, it has been shown uh, this dashed line representing this uh, low uh, low scenario, but high impacts uh, on, on sea level rise of multimeter sea level rise due to the Antarctic ice sheets. And um, they, they couldn't really rule out these scenarios, okay, that could happen if uh, emissions are not mitigated at all. So in the, in the scenario 8.5, um, so the, this this scenario and those uncertainties are, are the basis of the instant program. This is why we we wrote it and we formed it actually. And um, uh, when we are looking at how the different IPCC report treated the sea level uncertainty and the Antarctic problem, uh, actually it has been really an evolution because we know that I mean until the the, the pen, penultimate uh, IPCC report, Antarctica was not really considered as a as a major issue because we were unsure about its contribution. And uh, while closing the budget of sea level rise. And uh, we, we definitely uh, started to witness some uh, signal from the Antarctic ice sheet that it was melting from below the ice shelf that are at the heart of the instability behaviors. And because of that, um, those uh, high, uh, high risk scenarios that uh, here are, sh are shown in, in orange might already lead to multimeter sea level rise. And if we add an, an instability behavior, Linked to marine ice sheet instability in Antarctica, this could be even worse uh, in a in a very short amount of time. That could be a few decades to a, a couple of centuries, and this timing is is definitely uh, something that we can constrain now from paleo data, and that's also something that is very important for instance. So. Actually, instance, um, the, the main motivation is really to, to improve the sea level rise projections. And to do that, we really want to use the, the maximum observation that we have. But this means bridging the past observation with the present day observation to really improve the, the sea level projections. And this bridging of the communities is really uh, one of the main overarching objective of the, of the SRPs. And to do that, um, we need to, to really improve our understanding of uh, all the interaction between the, the atmosphere, the oceans, the solidars, and, and the ice sheets. Because um, most of the, the, the unknown that we have now uh, are really linked with the, the interface between all the components of the climate system. Them. And for, for now, the gaps that we have, they, they are a bit hampering uh, the fact uh, that we, uh, we, uh, we want to really constrain the rate of sea level change. So uh, if we really want to uh, understand a bit better those rate determining, rate determining processes uh, linked with the instability and threshold, we really need to embrace the entire uh, polar climate system. Um, 
then all those uh, improvements, of course, will serve to uh, improve and validate the physics that we have in the ice sheet models, but not only, also in the climate models, uh, atmospheric models, and, and oceanic models as well, uh, which are a big part of uh, the, the Antarctic ice sheet instabilities. And all together, I mean, the instant, um, let's say, uh, scientific objectives aims at uh, really helping the, the policymakers and uh, practitioners and uh, end users to really anticipate and assess the risks uh, that are linked with a very rapid and large sea level rise. Uh, because the, the key word for our century now is definitely adaptation, uh, as far as we are talking about sea level rise, because of course we cannot avoid sea level rise. It's just a matter of Perhaps we can lim limiting a bit the rate of sea level rise, but we cannot avoid it. So adaptation is really the, the key word of the of, of our century right now. Um, so the instant program right now is, is really structured around three main themes, actually. The first one is related to the interaction between the ice sheet and our atmosphere and ocean processes. Uh, especially in the marine-based part of Antarctica, where those instabilities uh, could occur if a, a tipping point is crossed uh, at some point, both in atmospheric or in oceanic temperature. Our improved understanding, um, yeah, uh, the second theme that is linked with the uh, solid earth feedbacks on ice sheet dynamics, because um, while solid earth with glacial uh, static adjustment can um, slow down a bit the, the instabilities if it occurs in, in some of the marine based areas of Antarctica. And the third theme is definitely uh, built around how can we improve uh, with all this knowledge uh, the Antarctic contribution to global mean sea level change in, in the future. So those are the three main themes and pillars of instance. And um, just to illustrate that, actually, well, the, the, the Antarctic actually, of course, is part of a, a very uh, complex system that uh, is not only the climate system, but we also have the solid earth that is part of the, the let's say, the solid uh, layers of the of the planet. So, I mean, the the system is really uh, is really complex. Okay, so all those interactions are interacting together, but they are all playing a role in those instabilities. The instabilities can be uh, due to the, the melting uh, from the ice shelf uh, from below due to, due to the ocean warming. So this is the so-called marine ocean instabilities that can uh, create a retreat of the grounding line in a very uh, short amount of time. Um, but this can also happen because well, there is another process called the marine ice cliff instability that, that can happen if we have some surface melting that creates some hydro fracturing at the ice shelf fronts that also create a very rapid retreat of the, of the grounding line. So all those instability and thresholds uh, can be a bit slowed down, uh, inhibited by uh, the feedback that we have with the solidars. So all the, the, the figures that we have been put in these slides are really the basis uh, of the process that we want to study both in the past and at present to, to really improve uh, our understanding of the sea level projections. So this is the main instance structure, okay? So with the first themes around atmosphere ocean uh, interactions, second about the, the solid earth ice interaction and the, the third themes about uh, the, let's say, science to stakeholder interaction about sea level projections. In each of the themes, some subcommittees have been uh, built. Uh, they have been kicked off by the communities. Uh, and they all uh, are looking at different aspects of those interactions, and uh, both in the past and at present. So that's that's really important. And um, uh, what is really important is that instant is really connected to uh, partners within the SCAR, uh, with the different groups, as we, we mentioned before, but the other SRPs, uh, actually, and uh, action groups and expert groups, uh, etc. And also, so connected to external international initiative because of course instant is not the only program looking at this problem of Antarctica and uh, what is really important is that the aim of instant is not to duplicate what is going on outside in the, those very great other initiatives that are actually uh, um, partner uh, at all effects uh, with instant but to uh, facilitate the the collaboration 
uh, in order to, to really optimize the, the development of the science uh, and to fill the knowledge gap that we have in the different aspects of those interactions. So because Instant is, is very big and very multidisciplinary, we had also to, uh, uh, to, um, to get support to, uh, from a very large uh, team of leaders <laughs> that also help uh, dealing with the different aspects of the, of the research program. And um, the, all the team is very international. Uh, we, we try to really uh, um, involve uh, diversity uh, from different countries and uh, different gender, different uh, career levels uh, in the leadership. So uh, it's, it's still moving because some subcommittees are still kicking off uh, in, this, in this moment. So it's, it's uh, I mean, that's the last update of our leadership. So instant right now is uh, a bit more than 300 members actually. And uh, a large third is, uh, is made by early career and PhD students and uh, master's students. So uh, this early career part of, of instant is really important. And uh, we are now starting to develop a, a program to engage them uh, in, a, in, a, in a better way. I mean, uh, our member are distributed over more than 30 countries and uh, what is really important with the program is that um, we really want it to be inclusive and, and really diverse. I mean, the, the program is open to everyone, anyone that wants to contribute. I mean, there is no, uh, uh, there is no um, let's say, uh, requirements to be part of Instant, just motivation, patient, and uh, willing to, to communicate the science uh, all together. So uh, this is why we really we are really uh, willing to develop a strong collaborative network. Uh, of scientists that are able to deal with uh, multidisciplinary uh, aspect of the polar system um, in order to, to really develop uh, excellent science that, that can be really impactful for the society, not only for the IPCC report, but direct, directly for the society, because this is what the SRPs are made for, actually. So this has been the timeline that we have been um, uh, trying to sum up uh, for the instance uh, program since the, it, it was kicked off in February 21. Um, so we have been, we have been developing the, the leadership and the subcommittees during the, the, the first year, basically. But uh, all you see, uh, all the, the blue uh, writing that you see on this timeline are also related to the international initiative uh, um, instant participated to. Uh, and all those initiatives are related to um, IPCC process and uh, uh, improving definitely the, the, um, the protections and the, the society uh, relevance of the science that we are trying to develop in collaboration with all the external partners. And um, uh, what is really important is that Instant has been also represented in, in different uh, external activities by the, the partners uh, that, that we have. And um, uh, we, we have been trying to develop the communication because uh, it was really important for Instant to be uh, really present and also communicative with the member, with, which has been a bit challenging because of the pandemic. Uh, Period as for all the other SRPs and uh, other initiative actually, but uh, now we are resuming and uh, I would say we are definitely more motivating than, than before. And um, many things have been have been ongoing uh, during this uh, year and a half. Uh, and in particular, we developed a fellowship. And uh, this year was the first year we granted the fellowship for instance. So each of the fellows got $5,000 dollars for developing the research program. And uh, they are all from different countries and uh, they are spanning different aspects uh, of the, the instant program. Uh, so that's, that's really what we wanted actually. Uh, so that, that's the first fellowship and we are very proud about, about that. Capacity building is, is really something that we really want to push. And as such, um, we are sponsoring different activities as well. So. Uh, this year, uh, we, we have the RINGS Action Group to kick off because uh, the RINGS Action Group is, is really important and uh, the aim is to um, map the grounding line around Antarctica because we, we only know where the grounding line is in very few portions of Antarctica and if we want to understand better the instabilities, we definitely need to map a bit better those, those areas. So we have been uh, helping the RINGS Action Group to, to kick off. We have been uh, supporting um, 
a sedimentation uh, school uh, that was actually bipolar. Uh, it was not only about Antarctica, but about Greenland, because actually sea level change is a global problem. It's not only about Antarctica. So we, are, we have been supporting the, the school. And uh, there are many other activities that are coming up and uh, that instant it is sponsoring, actually. We have been very much uh, visible uh, at international level. We have been participating to the COP26 uh, thanks to the support of the IC and um, and, and SCAR in general that uh, always support the, the, its own SRPs uh, in uh, getting visible actually. Um, so we, we we had very nice side events about uh, the risk scenarios, about uh, irrevers irreversible sea level rise with Rob De Conto and Tom uh, at the at the COP. And um, team was really active in the Antarctic Treaty uh, meeting that happened uh, last June uh, in Berlin. We have been also having some uh, side events at the UN Ocean Conference uh, about uh, polar activities and uh, sea level rise. So instant is really is really active. And the last was the, 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 the most recent was the participation to the WRCP sea level conference in Singapore. That was also uh, the opportunity for the policy um, community to really meet and uh, discuss about how to retrieve beta proxy and how to improve the understanding of past sea level change due to the, the, the different ice sheets in the northern and, and the southern hemisphere. So um, I think the SRP has been very, very active. Uh, and uh, recently we are started to develop a, a newsletter just to catch up uh, with, uh, with everyone and to allow the, the, the big community of Instant to, to stay tuned with all the activities actually. So many different things are, are ongoing. The different themes of Instant also have a webinar series. So if you just subscribe to uh, the instant mailing list, you, you might be uh, advertised. Right now, we are trying to push the, um, uh, a couple of activities for the coming year. Uh, the first one is a special issue that we really want to, to develop, not to make the review of the, the state of the knowledge, but to um, push the border of the science and to create debates on the key um, processes that are at the heart of the Antarctic uh, instabilities, actually. So what we, what we want with this special issue is to provide to design some direction for the new science of the upcoming years, uh, all together with the external partners. So this is an open special issue. And if you are interested to contribute, please um, uh, tell us and uh, contact us and uh, we can discuss uh, about that. But uh, the, the concept of the special issue is, is really to uh, identify the big challenges and how we can address that and right now, both uh, bridging the past in the paleo community with the present day community. And the last activity actually is about the um, instant conference that will happen in Trieste next year in, in September. So we, have, we are uh, starting now to uh, organize it. Um, it will be a big conference. Uh, I mean, we, we are quite optimistic that we will have some something around three to 500 participants. So uh, because of the multidisciplinary of the conference, I think it will be definitely great. Uh, of course, uh, all the other SRPs uh, are definitely will be invited to, to participate to this conference because, I mean, this is a, a common problem. Um, what we really would like is to maximize the the, let's say the, 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 the building, the capacity building of the conference. So uh, all the format will be like big plenaries during the morning and break, breaking groups in the afternoon. But the, the, one of the important things is that the last day of the conference will be dedicated to all the big international initiatives that will be invited to the conference. Um, just to, to give resonance to, to this problem and, uh, and trying to kick off some of the challenges that we want to develop uh, in the different uh, scientific um, initiatives uh, that are already uh, going on, like uh, ISMIP and something a bit beyond ISMIP and uh, trying to really improve the, the sea level rise projection. So I guess that's uh, the end of the presentation. So if you want to know more, uh, go and, um, and visit the Instant website, but also don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, I mean, the Instant community is really reactive and uh, responsive, so don't, don't hesitate. Thank you very much. Thanks, Florence. And uh, again, I mean, Florence, 
covered a lot of ground there and I'm sure some of you have some questions. So please feel free to put them in the, the Q&A function on uh, Zoom and we'll talk about them after our next presentation. We have the panel. So last up, third, we have Ant Icon. So this scientific research program aims to answer the fundamental science questions relating to conservation and management of Antarctica and Southern Ocean. So you can see how the three research programs do fit well together. And ICON focuses on the research to drive and inform international decision-making and policy change. So the program is currently led by Mecha Santos from the Argentinian Antarctic Institute. Today's talk is being given by Daniela Liggett from the University of Canterbury in New, Se in New Zealand on behalf of the program. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Daniela, over to you. Thank you, Stuart and Kia ora, everyone. It's quite a challenge to follow in those footsteps of Tom and Flo, who gave an excellent talk summarizing the two other SRPs. So first of all, thank you also to, to Matcha and the Anti-Icon leadership team for allowing me to give this talk today, which will give you an introduction of the rationale for Anti-Icon to be established in the first place, introduce its objectives and also the research themes that are organized under and icons umbrella and and then finally we'll look at a few highlights of our activities over the last year or a bit more than a year now as well as our future plans as you're all aware antarctic and southern ocean environments are threatened at multiple levels systemically by pressures related to anthropogenic climate change and locally and regionally also by a range of human activities some of which you can see depicted here on those photos and those are just a few of the stresses that i'm sure you're all aware of and that i don't need to go into detail on so as a result, an icon was developed to be able to really systematically respond to requests for scientific advice on a range of issues that are related to Antarctic and Southern Ocean conservation, as well as environmental management. And those requests have been voiced by the Antarctic Treaty parties for a few years now, and an icon took it upon itself to um, develop some high level objectives that respond to this need for evidence based advice. And it does so by facilitating and coordinating high quality research on pertinent conservation challenges in a very integrative and collaborative manner that also ideally draws on and includes and invites different frames of references and different frames, uh, different ways of knowing um, that then all contribute to inform policy and environmental governance. And specifically, and ICON aims to inform policy and also behavioral responses to emerging priority issues by increasing our awareness and understanding of current and potential future environmental issues in the Antarctic and Southern Ocean. Uh, we aim to proactively identify vulnerable or at risk species, ecosystems and environments, aim to assess risk levels in that respect, and also contribute to the development of mitigation strategies. While all at the same time, critically exploring a range of holistic and integrated approaches to Antarctic conservation and environmental governance working also primarily with those key stakeholders that you see there identified by logos on this slide. In terms of its structure and ICON pursues the objectives that I've just outlined to you um, through three parallel but very synergistic and collaborative research themes which are referred to in short as R1, R2 and R3 shown here and summary on the slide, plus a science synthesis theme that aims at integrating outputs to inform policy decision-making and also aims at understanding decision-making processes in order for research outcomes to really be able to be most effectively used 
towards guiding and advising and informing that. So let's have a look at our research themes in turn now. Um, R1 focuses on species and ecosystems assessments and is very, very future focused in that it aims to identify future vulnerabilities, drawing on forecasts that take into consideration, for instance, climatic changes, but also a range of other drivers of change, such as incursion of non-native species, pollution, changes in ice coverage, or various pressures from uh, commercial activities such as um, fishing or tourism that arise in an integrated or that are looked at in an integrated manner, acknowledging those cross biome connections. And you can already see here that this research theme is very linked to both NCLIM now and instant in its very nature. R2 now explores human activities impact Antarctic and Southern Ocean ecosystems. And it has a goal of quantifying levels of anthropogenic risk for these environments. Um, R2 also considers the present character as well as, again, it's got a somewhat future focus, as well as a projection of how those human activities may change in the future in order for us to be able to derive an understanding of cumulative impacts and to develop mitigation strategies. And then we have R3, which examines socio-ecological connectivity, assuming or surmising that human perceptions and activities cannot be separated from the wider environment in which they're situated. And also that effective environmental management really needs to take into consideration this connectivity. As such, R3 assesses how humans have shaped or reshaped and interacted with Antarctica in the Southern Ocean in the past and the present, and how there are possibly going to interact with these environments in the future. It also considers how ideas about conservation have shifted from across time, ultimately testing um, the suitability of alternative approaches to Antarctic conservation and their ethical dimensions for future policy making. And then the synthesis theme, S1, takes also a very integrated approach and works closely and directly with stakeholders to ensure that all the other research themes are one, are two, and are three, provide meaningful outcomes that can inform the range of environmental governance dimensions that are listed here um, on this slide. So S1 will also work, um, undertake work to really try to understand biases and uncertainties that flow into decision making and how we can use them to our advantage rather than work against them. S1 will also explore effective pathways for anti-icon research to enter into decision-making processes and broader frameworks. So each of those four themes that sit under the anti-icon umbrella are led by a team of three researchers um, that are all listed here that make up our steering committee. One of the three researchers for each of the themes is an EMCR or early to mid-career researcher, which also facilitates capacity building within an icon. And all of those are, are listed here as well. And then we have a leadership team that is made up of two chief officers. And here I really like to give a shout out to Alex Tarouz, who's done some extraordinary work as a past chief officer of and icon and has also really driven the SRP planning group. And you may recall that Dana talked a bit about SRP planning groups and how they assist in the process of establishing and SRP as a ground as a bottom-up approach. And really Alex has done terrific work and we wouldn't be here without his enthusiasm and commitment. And we have this leadership team that is listed here with two chief officers and two deputy chief officers. And 
I have been looking forward to possibly replace Alex subject to approval by the SCAR delegates that are meeting in September. Then we also have an advisory committee to provide us with oversight, critique, and also close link to the other SCAR groups, the SCAR SFPs, and uh, other SCAR subsidiary bodies, as well as our most important stakeholders and external collaborators. We are currently still in the process of setting up the advisory committee, which however already had a first meeting as part of the SCAR Open Science Conference business meetings. Um, and we will keep you posted on that development, but I do want to acknowledge the individuals that have already committed to making an effort and joining the advisory committee and, and expertise in that capacity. Over the last year, just like the other SAPs, we really focused on setting up our structure and administrative processes and also ran a series of community engagement workshops in order to a stimulate interest in and icon and its work and also arrive at a better understanding of how we can most feasibly achieve our objectives like the other SAPs, and they haven't mentioned it that explicitly this time around but we've also run a very successful logo contest um, amongst early career researchers, and you can see the outcome on all of our slides, um, which we're very, very happy with. And we've set up our online presence. So in the next few years, we plan on holding a number of workshops that are ideally integrated and also interact with the other SRPs, um, as well as training workshops and stakeholder workshops. Um, which will allow us to really form more tighter or tighter connections with our key policy stakeholders. And we also aim to very directly through our time engage with that kind of community, as well as putting in place a fellowship program, which I will say a few more words about in a minute. And we have been present at the SCAR OC. In, with various sessions, and I know that a number of you were joining the mini symposium and some of our other sessions, and it's nice to see you again in the participant list today. And you will remember that the SCAR SCATS mini symposium, so that was co-organized by and co-sponsored by ENDICON and the Standing Committee on the Antarctic Treaty System on policy making and conservation and how SCAR science really informs and guides, and can guide in the future, Antarctic um, policy making was really, really well attended and really successful. We've got a lot of food for thought that will now also flow into our future activities and into the synthesis themes. I've already touched on the fact that we are working with SCATs to develop a fellowship and an icon fellowship. This fellowship will sponsor two fellows per year to work with a mentor or a team of mentors to make a substantial contribution to SCAR's participation in the AATCM CP meetings or the Scientific Committee of Kemla, respectively. And whether this is by presenting a paper or preparing a paper to be presented at those meetings or in other ways that is yet to be decided and really also depends on the potential applicants and fellows expertise and backgrounds and interests fellows will receive up to five thousand us dollars to cover travel and accommodation expenses to participate in those meetings um but we will expect a time leading up to the meetings to be also contributing to SCAR's participation and uh, the preparation of documents that will be submitted to these meetings in return. And again, after that, this workshop is currently in development and we hope to be able to announce it later this year to be able to already 
select fellows for next year's CAMLAR and ATCM slash CP meetings. Also, <laughs> the big thank you here to the British Acad Academy Knowledge Frontiers grant for sponsorship and Adrian Hopkins, one of the Anticon steering committee members and one of the co-leads of Research Theme 3. Um, we can already announce that we're hosting a workshop at SPRI at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge in the middle of September in order to undertake a comparative assessment of the interactions between Antarctic environments and landscapes, as well as human activities in A, the South Shetland Islands and the Antarctic Peninsula region on the one hand, and then B, on the other hand, the McMurdo Dry Valleys and the Ross Sea region. So we, we want to really understand how these interactions between humans and those environments inform and shape Antarctic environmental governance and to what extent some of the lessons that we have learned can be used in the future to frame Antarctic conservation efforts. So if you're interested in getting involved, we do have web presence and social media presence and you can sign up on our website to our newsletter as well. And you can follow us on those various social media accounts. So thank you to all those that have really made an icon into what it is. Um, and also to all of you for listening. And we hope to see you at one of our events in the future. Thank you. Stop the share now. Thanks, Daniela. And thank you to all our speakers so far. So we've got about 50 minutes now of a panel discussion. Uh, our Q&A hasn't been flooded with questions yet, so I do encourage those of you who are, have listened to these three great presentations to, um, to put some questions in there. I can start with a few questions. Um, so unless anyone has any burning questions now, I'll, I'll start talking. So first one then, I guess, to, to Daniela, you just finished. ANTCLIM now is focused on climate variability and, and your scientific research program lists as one of four research themes, integrated forecasting of future change. How important do you think current variability and that near term predictability is with respect to forecasting that kind of change? So really that link to, to ANTCLIM now and where do you see that working for, for ANT ICON? Mm, good question to which I can uh, only think of one immediate and very obvious answer that it would be really, really important to link because without the data and without the knowledge that NCON now can contribute, um, we really don't have the physical science representation in our themes at the moment. So we very much rely on input from NCON now in terms of um, this kind of variability, climate variability in the near future and also the long term future, ideally, but I know that income now doesn't really go into those extents, as I understand it, but Tom, please correct me if that's not right. So, and we hope that by a having a member or representative from NCLM now on our advisory committee, but also hopefully in the future, once we also can get together, maybe at least in some, sometimes in person again, and having some hybrid online events to be able to facilitate a knowledge exchange between all SOPs to a greater extent. And that's where this kind of information that will hopefully come from NCLM now and obviously also INSEN and other existing publications and research under other SCAR subsidiary bodies or even outside groups. Um, and that goes into the IPCC and draws on the IPCC will become really important. Tom, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say, Tom, yeah, post. Yeah, I can add more to that. Certainly, overall, I agree uh, that you know work, working together is going to be important on looking at these uh, near-term timeframes, and in fact. Working with Ant, sorry, working with Ant Icon will be really useful in terms of identifying um, identifying the, the priorities for 
for for which variables and how we might focus our efforts on on looking at projections. So one example is that there's a we're actually working on a, an early manuscript at the moment, and um, one of the one of the things I'm I've already started doing actually a little bit is uh, talking to a couple of people in Acklin now about how we how we design the parameters we look at in terms of the the near term change that is most relevant to um, to Anticon or you know people in other disciplines. So so it's a two way thing. I think you know when we're doing our studies of these near term conditions that it's important to make sure we talk to to you to anti-icon um and in, involve you right from the start in, in these discussions and then it, that'll help make sure that you know what what we end up producing it, you know is is as relevant as it, as it can be thanks tommy yeah i think it, from from my point of view in my work it is a really important question that difference between near term predictability and, and longer term change and, and how we sort of incorporate variability compared to predictability and, and long term change into, into impacts and stuff that and icons doing so I, clearly there are links. There, there is a, a question in an anonymous attendee is posted in our Q and a so i'll read it out. Are any of the groups in SCAR focusing on actually reducing emissions associated with Antarctic research? Our group uses a lot of fossil fuels because we do not have other options. Is there a group or country that is leading the charge on this? Daniela, do you, do you have any comment on that one? Oh, what a great question. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I'm totally on board with what you're saying and where you're getting there. I mean, unfortunately, at the moment, um, we are not directly focusing on actively and actually reducing emission other than the actions that we might take as individuals associated obviously with the research but also as um, living our own lives and trying to be as responsible as possible we also realize that we do have a role to play in recommending this kind of change to policy fora, such as the ADCM and the CEP meeting um, to COMNAP. And this is where the role of SCATS, of the Standing Committee on the Antarctic Treaty System, comes in as the um, body that really pulls together research from the different SCAR research, scientific research programs, as well as other groups, and puts it into um, potentially actionable or at least items that will be discussed at the meetings and information papers or working papers or working with parties directly to write certain policy recommendations that arise from our understandings um, of um, what is likely to happen and what might be the best option. To pursue in the future. Unfortunately, as you know, I mean, the Antarctic Treaty system operates on a consensus basis. So it is sometimes hard to get consensus on drastic measures and also measures that the treaty members or the representatives at the treaty meetings might see outside their direct purview or their responsibilities. So this is where I think all of us in the SCAR community and the broader polar research community come in, in terms of also trying to get our own governments and our own national tactic research programs to consider these questions. And I know that a number of uh, national tactic programs are already thinking about that, about use of fossil fuels and their footprint. But I wouldn't be able to really single out a group or country that is leading the charge on this. I'm sorry, maybe. Uh, no, uh, Danem, maybe maybe no you more. have some comment on this. Um, yes, and, and I just wrote, I don't know if it got in there, I just wrote an answer to that question and the question got disappeared as soon as I hit send. It, but, it's in um, the answer in section a, now, but you can you can talk it. 
In, in, okay, it is in it is in there. Um, so I, I just went attended the the um, human impacts on Antarctica session that was um, earlier today, and there was a really great presentation given by Krista Myers from the U.S. McMurdo Dry Valleys LTR, and the LTR has actually established a sustainability group, and um, they have a questionnaire. I don't have the link, but they have a questionnaire out on Google looking for other people that are interested in this as well. And so her talk will be part of the recorded session, and those will be posted when the, um, at some point when the Open Science Conference gets all the recordings together, they will be at the SCAR YouTube channel. Um, but that, that, as far as I know right now, that, that's the only thing that I'm aware of as a formal group that is addressing this. Thanks, Deneb. So, uh, I'm good. Sorry, I'm can I just I jump in there? Can I jump yeah. in there? Um, and maybe suggest that SCAR might want to consider just like um, addressing EDI issues, equity, diversity, and inclusion issues in a specific subsidiary body. How about we think about sustainability that way as well? I mean, it might, I'm not saying it's supposed to be a group that really stimulates a lot of action, but at least considers it also in line with future SCAR open science conferences. And I know that there was a consideration given also in terms of the SCAR strategic plan to reduce our carbon footprint in the SCAR community. So maybe it might be worthwhile to think about the potential contributions and options that such a group might be able to propose. And um, just in response to Monica Milbert's question regarding tourism, which I know a bit more about, because so I've been doing quite a bit of research on tourism governance. Um, and Monica asked whether this aspect, the sustainability group, I assume, or these discussions also apply, apply to tourism. And I know that IATO and the tourism operators are actually working quite hard on thinking about their carbon footprint, and they do quite a bit of carbon footprint auditing a lot of the larger antarctic tourism operators do and they try they are aiming for carbon zero which is not necessarily as feasible as it might be in other areas but they are working on that quite actively and a lot of the companies also have very transparent carbon budgets that they share if you go to the various kind of, um, company websites I think you can possibly find out more about that thank you thanks I think there, there are things going on would be the real short summary of this but I think there's a lot more we could be doing it and needs to be done yeah and, and Tom's just put there in the the chat many national programs do have their own efforts uh, no, the Australian Antarctic Division are also working hard to try and reduce their footprint in Antarctica. I think many other nations are. Got a question to you, Flo. It's, you know, instant is all about ice sheets and sea level rise. So how do you see that kind of focus of, uh, I guess, the macroscopic change um, contributing to the more human-focused work of Ant Icon and the conservation socio-ecological approaches. Do you, do you, I'm sure there is a role. How do you think it works? Well, so um, instant is really focused on, let's say, medium to long-term uh, sea level projections in the sense that we are looking at instability thresholds. But uh, the, the consequence of the instability is very huge for the ecosystem around Antarctica, of course, because uh, if, uh, I mean, the, the, ice shelf, the ice shelf collapse, it changes completely uh, the relationship of the ecosystem with the with the ice sheet, of course. So um, this will have lots of consequences at all level of the of the food chain, uh, actually, and uh, for all the species. I mean, if the ice shelf collapse, it means that the ocean is really warm. So yeah, I guess that most of the of, of the species around Antarctica will already have been suffering from some changes or uh, would have migrated or somehow, if we arrive to ice shelf disintegration, 
uh, which is what what happened in this um, high risk, uh, low statistical scenarios uh, linked with the RCP 8.5 emission uh, um, representative pathway, then I would say, um, well, the entire ecosystem will suffer from changes. So the link with Titan for me is really obvious because, um, well, in instant, we also are looking at the paleo climate changes around Antarctica and paleo ice sheet changes of Antarctica itself. And um, we are already using some ecosystem um, based uh, studies uh, to really understand how the, the, the continental shelf changed and uh, how the how the continental slope changed and the oceanic circulation changed in relationship with the ice sheet advances and retreats during the glacial interglacial. So we, we are already looking at the link with the ecosystem. So to me, Antaikon, the link with Antaikon are really obvious with sea level change, of course. Thanks, Flo. Uh, Daniela, do you want to respond? Do you want to put your perspective on it? Um, not, I, I mean, I don't have that much to add to that one, but I want about some of the other questions popping up in the q and I know that the NAP is attending to one of them. Um, yeah, look, uh, look there's, there's two two questions that popped up in the Q&A. And I mean, the one of them there is how, how can SCAR be more aggressive to stop humanity to destroying our planet? It's a very provocative question. I don't think we're going to spend too much time delving into that now but but it's been asked so i i put it to the the panel if anyone wants to give a brief answer to that question daniela i can say something about that because I, sure. I do feel quite strongly about it but it's not a it's not just scar that actually produces change it's all of us as individuals and b in terms of aggressiveness i i don't really like this term and i don't think it leads anywhere really because we have to realize that we we are in some way advisors and we can recommend actions in the antarctic treaty consultative meeting for instance in the cp or in sc Hamler, we can strongly urge but we cannot make parties change their views um, or their actions at home unless this is also being supported by their constituency in terms of what kind of governments do we elect, what, what's the structure of society in general. So this goes far, far beyond what SCAR can do. SCAR can provide advice and urge to act, but I don't think taking a more aggressive stance will get us anywhere, nor is it SCAR's role to be aggressive. It's not an NGO in that context. It's part of the International Council international science council and is offering evidence-based advice on matters and obviously the evidence points strongly into a certain direction and SCAR will repeat and reiterate um, that kind of evidence and the direction in which it points but I don't think being aggressive about anything we have to work with the diversity of views out there and diversity of opinions to provide um, to stimulate right choices being made I think that's a really good answer. Um, Deneb, unless you have really want to add to it, I think we'll move on. Let's move on. So we've got a few polls that are open or that I can open now that we wanted to ask as well. So it might just take a couple of minutes now if I press to launch the poll button. Hopefully you can all now see the, the poll pop up. We have five questions. It'd be great if you could all answer those questions. I'm assuming it's visible to everybody. Starting to get some answers coming through. Well, while, while you're answering that poll, I've got a question for you, Tom, and it's kind of relevant as well to, to what Daniela was talking about earlier. 
So ant clim now is, is near-term variability in prediction. And, and this sets the uh, ant clim now apart from ant clim 21, which was the earlier iteration that examined change out of the 21st century. So in that context of you know, near-term or predictability, where do you see the role of, of instant and ice sheet instability and sea level rise coming into the, the picture? So key events like you know, Larsen, collapse of the last ice sheet show that and these thresholds can be crossed now and they can be crossed very quickly and make major changes. So does Ant Klim now take that lens on it or, or do you think we need to take that lens on it and, and, and that link back to instant? It's, um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of crossing, um, thresholds and that type of thing the internal variability of the climate system is a, a, a major factor i could uh i could even share my screen and show a plot go on then um, but uh this is from the the joint session we had um the other night with, between now and uh and, and scats um and it just illustrates the role of in internal variability when you're thinking about uh, projections in temperature, for example. So I showed a plot a little bit like this during the present recorded presentation earlier on. And so on the left is a fairly standard map of temperature changes across planet Earth and uh, some multi-model mean of the projections but when you look at a particular location rather a station chosen partly because it's a, a uk station but in any case if you follow a climate model simulation of temperature at, at that location uh, for those of you who don't know rather is somewhere on the antarctic peninsula just on the west side there um, but in any case, you know, if you look at one climate model simulation, then you can see this is an average for June, July, August, so with the winter mean, so it's a seasonal mean temperature. And it's an anomaly, so zero there is an anomaly relative to historic, the, the late 20th century. And you can see how the temperature uh, varies. You know, there's a, a decade here where it's declining a bit, and then it goes up again, um, right about the present day here. Um, and there's some extreme years uh, in different directions. If you look at uh, the same climate model run again, um, you can see that, you know, the extreme years happen at different times as internal variability starts to play it more of a role, um, or you can start to see, see that contribution. Uh, this is an interesting one because you've run it again. There's a very warm year here back in sort of the early 1900s. And in fact, that warm year, the temperature for that isn't exceeded until, um, you know, probably about, I think that happens to be about 2040, 2030, something like that. Um, so you can still get these warm years and cold years. And if you're thinking about crossing thresholds of certain ice shelves and other areas, um, there's quite a large range of timings of that that could happen in, into the future, you know, uh, through the 20th and 21st century. Um, so that's just an example to illustrate uh, that the, the, the the timing of various events in the climate system um, depends quite a lot on understanding both the background force change and in internal variability. So I think there's a strong connection there that you know we could develop with instant in terms of um, looking at factors that relate to, to that type of situation. Thanks, Tom. Floyd, do you want to? Add anything to that? 
Well, I think uh, Tom has uh, pretty well explained everything. Um, I think stress should start by short-term processes anyway. <laughs> so it's all part of the same. It's so it's all part of the same threshold actually. It's just that um, the ice sheet reacts on the longer longer term. Um, but it starts always uh, changes in uh, near term variability. So uh, I mean the. Once again, the, the connection here with uh, unclean now is, is really obvious, actually. Yeah, I agree. So I'll, I've closed the, the poll now, and I think if I press that share results button, hopefully you can all see them now. Um, and we can see, where, unsurprisingly, perhaps the, the bulk of our audience is coming from South America, because the last time this was shown was a fairly inhuman time for for definitely South America, North America as well. I think Denebi said it was 2 a.m. And we can see that majority of people here are not currently involved in one of the scientific research programs. So I think that's something for all of us who are involved to, to try and address. I mean, we want more people involved. And I guess I'll ask the question in a minute, actually, if we, if we go through, if you're not currently involved, which SRPs are you interested in? And uh, sorry, Flo, but Instant doesn't do so well, but I think you know, there's a good range there. What is our the current career level? Again, we, we're pretty even across. And then what is your area of expertise? And I see that we're well represented by life sciences today, which is probably why Ant Icon maybe got the gig. So talk, talking of that, well, most of it, the people here today are not currently members of an S, one of the three SRPs. So I know we touched on it in, in our in talks today, but what does membership look like? What are the what are the commitments from members? And you know, why should someone get involved? And what does being involved mean? I'll just go through the three of you. So in the... Oh, I was going to say in the order of our talks and Tom first, but yeah, I'll do that. Tom first. I know this could be pretty similar answers for anyone, everyone. So make it brief. That's fine. Yeah. Um, getting involved, the main thing, the main advantage, okay, I'll, I'll start at the beginning. To get involved is very straightforward. So you can go to our website and and sign up on the forum. And there's a, it, for Anklin now, there's a choice there. You can either just uh, sign up to the mailing list and then receive um, emails that are relevant to our area of research, or sign up to be a, a more integrated member. Uh, and the, the latter, uh, the latter one means that you would. Uh, be more involved in some of the uh, some of the activities that we have running. So one example is our um, project on uh, maybe a, an Antarctic climate indicators, for example. And there's not a huge amount expected, but what what we, we do expect is that members participate at least in some of the activities. And you know, in, in to to a large extent, that's up to people in terms of how much time they have. We've got you know, nearly 100 members, and if each one of those people even made a one or two comments on a document we were producing, then you know, over, over a year, that, that would add up to quite a, quite a big contribution. So, so we don't ask a huge amount of people. A lot of the benefits that come from being involved are networking um, and opportunities in terms of uh, linking with other researchers to, to either work on papers or work on proposals and to get involved with the workshops that we run. Um, and, you know, to a, to a large extent, just have opportunities to, to to link up across a very wide community 
And if you're an early career researcher, there can be really excellent opportunities for capacity building, um, help to get to conferences and meetings. And Anklum now, as I know for the other research programs, is very keen on, on developing a diverse research base for Antarctica across you know, a range of backgrounds, countries and disciplines. So we're always trying to encourage encourage that side of things as well. But it's I'll well, stop there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Daniela, do you want to add some pers add a perspective from Ant Icon? Thank you. Um I'd like to start actually with my personal perspective if I may and then move into Ant Icon because I've been involved with SCAR forever, it seems, ever since since I really was involved in APEX and the Association of Polyolic Career Researchers and then moved into pushing um, the development of a social sciences action group at the time that then led to an expert group and then to a standing committee on the humanities and social sciences. Um, and the main reason for why I stayed involved was because it's an excellent opportunity to connect with people who are very much like you and the collegiality and the exper expertise within SCAR it is enormous and is not to be underestimated. And I really, really enjoyed working with so many people, diverse backgrounds across the world. And because we devote so much time to our research, it, it is always nice to have the safety net of pretty much SCAR friends around who you can call on and if you need help or if you need someone who needs to, who you want to talk on a certain topic for your lectures and at your own institution, then it always feels like you can go to someone who you connected with through SCAR. And that's what really kept me involved for such a long time. So that's my personal side. And in terms of and icon, I think, again, we've got such a great team of people who I really enjoy communicating with. So it stimulates um, your own passion and nurtures your passion and your research and opens your eyes to completely different approaches because it's very multidisciplinary. Um, and into this, and we are trying to aim to move towards interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, working much more in a collaborative approach with stakeholders and decision makers. And that's what makes it so rewarding. And Tom just said the networking, but I mean, in my eyes, networking doesn't quite even cut it. I mean, it's much more than that. You establish career long linkages to people that even when they become less involved with Sky, you might still be in touch with them. And you get such good ideas from interacting with them that might be useful for your own research. Now for and icon, I mean we really as then upset, SCAR does not fund research as such. So we really rely also on graduate students and PhD students and postdoctoral researchers to drive the research because a lot of us, we are all just volunteers donating our time in a way to SCAR because we are passionate about it, but we don't necessarily have all the research funding to drive this. So we welcome anyone who wants to do a PhD or a postdoctoral project on any of the related questions that we have posed and that are available from our implementation plans and also our website or just by getting in touch with us. I mean, we always like to hear from enthusiastic people uh, to connect to um, and to work with in the future. And then obviously we've, we will have those fellowships and workshops and most of the money within the groups and the SOPs goes to ECRs and capacity building in one way or another by allowing them to join our workshops and conferences and provide travel funding. So there's lots of reasons to get involved, but first and foremost, I think the people make it really fun. Excellent. Thank you. And Florence, your perspective? Well, actually, it's, it's very much what uh, both Daniela and Tom said. Actually, uh, I started with space as, a, let's say, end of early career and in, initial of uh, mid career. Um, but I, I was also uh, an Arctic person before. I'm still, <laughs> let's say, but uh, a bit less right now. 
Um, I was uh, I was really thrilled by the the fact that the Antarctic community is a big family. I mean, uh, that's uh, something that uh, perhaps in the Arctic is a bit less is a bit less obvious. And um, I would say, yeah, exactly the network within SCAR, but beyond SCAR, I think it's uh, it's it's really the the thing that make makes me keep me involved in the in the process actually because. Um, within SCAR, definitely it's a big family. I mean, uh, as we said, Instant or Anticon or Anticon now it doesn't make much difference. Actually, we are all working on Antarctica. So uh, we are all Antarctic scientists and we, we can all connect anytime, any moment during our campaigns or whatever. And I find that very powerful personally to develop both, both research but also personal relationships. Then what I find very strong as well, I mean, it's like as a member or as a leader in the SRPs or whatever you can then reach different um, aspects of the, let's say the Antarctic science. I, I mean, um, as an Antarctic scientist, you get involved in uh, so social science events uh, all over the world uh, all the time. Uh, also uh, in Italy, many, many times connect, connect with schools or, I mean, so um, it's more like what the SCAR brings to you. I mean, uh, so it's really open a lot of opportunities to do that. And then uh, you definitely enrich your own background. And uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like having a very diverse network uh, that's uh, made of scientists and not scientists. So. Um, if you if you join one of the SRPs, of course, I mean um, um, you can you can connect with any of the, of the subcommittees of the the SRP that we we are running. Uh, be active, but then use also what you learn within the SCAR to go beyond the SCAR. I mean, which is the I would say the main mission of all the scientists because we we are per, perhaps part of SCAR for a part of our career. Then we change because research evolves and our interests also evolve. Um, what is important is what you bring to SCAR and what SCAR can bring to you, I mean, as an individual, but also as a, I don't know, citizen of your country to solve the problem of climate change, for example, at different levels, could be science or not. So, yeah, to me, there are lots of benefits, definitely. I'm already benefiting from many of, the, of, of those aspects. So I'm not the only one. I mean, uh, many of the early carriers I talk to are already benefiting from that. So I think it's uh, mostly benefits. Very little pain, just like staying awake at two o'clock in the morning. Like, <laughs> I apologize for that bit of pain. Look, thanks very much. And I think they really, all three answers there really did show the benefits of, of signing up, of becoming involved in one of the scientific research programs. Danette, there was a question there around how someone gets involved with international action groups. And, and I know you wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Would you like to take the floor now and address that? Yes, thank you. So I did write a response. And then as I read it, I thought maybe I didn't fully address the question that was asked. Um, and I, I guess I would reiterate what the three speakers just said about um, getting involved. If you are interested in any of these groups at SCAR, whether it's the scientific research programs, the expert groups, the action groups, um, please go to the SCAR website and you can get in touch with the leadership for those groups. Um, the three SRPs all have uh, listservs and so you can sign up. Um, maybe you don't wanna be actively involved right now, but at least you can get on the mailing list and find out what they're doing. And then in terms of how these international groups actually work, um, within SCAR, there's a lot of synergy between groups. Um, we have standing committees that also interact with the subsidiary groups. Um, SCAR's mission is, is twofold. So one thing SCAR does is it helps to coordinate um, collaborations between international scientists. And then the second part of the mission is to provide advice um, to, to bodies that are involved in policy. And, and probably the main one of those is the Antarctic Treaty System. So the various subsidiary groups that we have actually feed into our standing committee on the Antarctic Treaty System. And when the treaty makes any kind of a request to SCAR, the standing committee on Antarctic Treaty System will go out um, to the subsidiary groups and request information. So within SCAR, our action groups, expert groups, standing committees, um, they all work um, together 
and um, it's a it's a really impressive operation, and it's a very impressive way that things are are brought together, and then how things get moved out into the international arena relative to how the data collected by SCAR scientists is applied in terms of policy and environmental management. So uh, again, I think that's probably a very vague kind of answer, um, but if you are interested in any aspect of SCAR, I would encourage you to get involved. Um, you can become active and you can become one of the people that actually helps things happen. Excellent response as well. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think that's really good. Uh, and said it really is beneficial i think to the to the members being involved it's something as florence said it's mostly about what you get out of it not what you have to put into it we're getting close to the the end of our hour what well, one of the questions i really want to answer and i've been wondering about it all day who do we think has the best icon like ant icon instant ant clim now it's a tough choice so if anyone wants to to put that in the chat as to who they think is the best I don't know where I'm voting yet, but okay. it's the big issues we should address. That's very cheeky, Stuart, I have to say, because they're <laughs> all so different and I but, I like them all myself. I couldn't decide. They're actually all excellent, aren't they? And uh, again, shows the, I think you all mentioned that the icons are mostly developed by collaboration with early career researcher members. Um, because we all know they have better digital skills than more established researchers. It's something that definitely goes down as you get more established. Um, anyway, I did notice a comment that that Monica Mulbert made in the chat a few minutes ago. It's around something that Anton van der Put said in a, a talk earlier this week, reminded us that the Antarctic is connected to the outside world and is up to all of us to make sure that we take the Southern Ocean and its influence to our local leaders, policymakers, but also to our fellow citizens. I mean, we, ha we have a duty really to explain and communicate the concept of thresholds and, and the influence that you know, Antarctica has on, on the globe and the influence that global change has on the Antarctica. It really is up to us. It's one of the key things of SCARA and these scientific research programs to be making that case. Don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that one, but uh, I thought, I mean, I know Danielle, you said something there back to Monica as well. It was, yeah. Yes, I can just thought. say it briefly. Um, I mean, it, it is really important to do that. And I totally agree with Monica, what she said there. And um, it is in a way our role as well as, citizens of this world um, that make up humanity to share what we know and try to help others in making the best choices that they can, considering the constraints of their livelihoods, of course. Um, but I think it would also be useful within SCAR to bring together approaches of uh, how people have successfully shared that kind of information and knowledge, because sometimes there's some really, really creative approaches out there. And I'm especially looking towards our, the early career, early and mid career researchers who are often, and here I'm just speaking about myself so much better with that than I am, for instance. Um, and I think having an archive or a repository of successful approaches that people are willing to share and lessons they learned, that might be quite helpful. And maybe our science communication or pair, um, and I forget what it stands for, the expert uh, an action group that is very much concerned with reaching out to policymakers and educators and others, they might be interested in hearing from you about approaches that you've had that worked. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Again, it really emphasizes the importance of working together. These are not three separate scientific research programs. They are, they've each got their own focus, but collaboration as with everything in the Antarctic Southern Ocean is really important. And we, we are more successful when we work together. Yeah, I mean, I 
could add just a, something to that as well, possibly, is that if we do really good science and communicate it very well, it, it, it should be the case that other people looking at that, those communications should, I mean, it can be done in a way that, that they can conclude themselves without us necessarily telling them that the situation could be urgent, for example. So if you lay out some of the things that research we're doing in a very clear way, um, in, a, in a, even quite an objective and clear way, um, you know, that can help people to reach those conclusions through, through seeing the evidence clearly. Thanks, Tom. We've just got a couple of minutes left. I don't know if anyone, if there, anyone has any other questions or if any of the panelists would like to make any further comment, now is your opportunity. Now I enjoyed reading everyone's questions and hearing from them and also seeing your enthusiasm and trying to make a difference and leaving a legacy. So continue that work and we look forward to also at some point seeing you in person keeping the carbon footprint in mind of course thank you uh, of course i'll i'll Dene, i'll let you make the last comment in a minute but uh otherwise then look i'll thank all our panelists daniela liggett from the university of canterbury tom bracegirdle the british antarctic survey and florence colleoni from ogs my italian translation is not good um I think it was a really great discussion that we had, and I think it really highlighted the wonderful work that had been done through the scientific research programs. Deneb, I'll, I'll, as Vice President for Science, I'll leave it open to you to, to have the last word maybe as we wrap it up. Um, okay, I, and I would like to say thank you to Stuart for um, for chairing this session for us, and, and also I'm very grateful to the, the presenters for talking about the various SRPs and then additional thank yous um, to Rachel from the SCAR Secretariat and also to the IT team that um, made the logistics possible for us. And again, I'd just like to thank all of you for attending and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Open Science Conference, which continues tomorrow and then through half of next week. I'd especially like to thank the IT team given the time it is in India right now. Um, it's fairly brutal. Thank you, Deneb, and thank you very much, everybody. Will. Thank Bye. you. See you. Wrap it up. Bye. Goodbye, Flo and Tom. Sleep well. <laughs> <laughs>